In this episode of ICS Connects, I'm speaking with Samira Isaac, and we talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the tourism industry and its way to recovery. So listen in and let's explore the future of exchange. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to ICS Connect. I'm here today with Sumaira Isaacs, the CEO of the World Tourism Forum Institute and a friend of mine. Uh, welcome to ICS Connect, Sumaira. Matthias, thank you so much for having me. Sumaira, um, I want to get right into it. Um, the tourism industry has been affected quite a bit. So could you give us a little bit of an overview of the effects um, COVID-19 had on the tourism industry and the outlook for recovery that you see? So, Matthias, I would like to start with the overall global picture of uh, what the travel and tourism uh, uh, food chain looks like and, and, where, and where the numbers were just uh, in 2019. So, according to 2019 data, tourism generated some 7% of the global trade, employed one in every 10 people globally, and through a very complex value chain of interconnected in industry, which means the direct and indirect jobs. For some countries, it can represent over 20% of their GDP. And mm -hmm. overall, it is the third largest export sector of the global economy. Due to COVID, international tourist uh, arrivals decreased by 56%. And uh, something like $320 billion in exports for, from tourism were lost in just the first five months of 2020. More than three times the loss and su uh, that surpasses the, uh, the, uh, the global economic crisis of 2009, the 2003 SARS uh, outbreak, and even uh, events of 11, uh, September 11, 2001 combined. So you can wow. imagine how huge the impact has been. Scenarios for the se sector indicate that the uh, international uh, tourist numbers could decline by 60 to 80% in 2020, which would translate into a drop in visitor spending from 1.5 trillion in 2019 to between 310 and 570 billion in 2020. You know, that's like staggering. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> over 100 million di direct tourism jobs at risk, many of them in micro, wow. small and medium sized enterprises, which employs a high share of women and young people. Mm -hmm. Informal workers are the most vulnerable. Overall, the road to recovery based on the GDP trends and earnings will stretch right into 2023. As for the geography, if you follow of, of the pandemic, China leads, followed by the developed uh, economies with emerging markets coming the last. Sector-wise, essential retail and telecoms are the first to rebound. Oil and gas and autos will be the last. Travel and tourism, real estate and capital goods and other corporate sectors are somewhere in between. So, um... If you, if you look at um, kind of the recovery and what's been happening so far, um, you, you mentioned 2023 as a, a goal of where it rebounds completely. Would that be back to 2019 levels in your opinion or does it take a little bit longer? No, they, uh, I mean, by some estimates, they are saying that even with, uh, 2016, 2017 levels. Okay, wow. Uh, and, um, but what will happen is that the recovery really, really depends on, uh, um, you know, uh, adaptability of the governments. Governments are taking a, a wide range of measures in response to the outbreak. The, the world tourism industry is set, I mean, it is a slow recovery. The global outbound travel uh, numbers expected to recover to pre-pandemic levels only in 2023 also predicted that the international tourism re receipts will only rebound nominally in 2022. So even 2021 or 2022, then the, the forecast doesn't look very promising. Could you say, when you look at different areas, like you look at... Um individual tourism, leisure tourism, business tourism, you look at um, cruise tourism, all of those different sectors and yeah. areas. Is there a kind of a differentiation which one will recover quicker than others? 
you know, right now it's all a one big melting pot. Everybody yeah. is in it together. And uh, the, the thing is the governments only understand the big data and the big data uh, of, uh, is in travel and tourism. It's not uh, just in one uh, vertical, you know, they understand the language of the big data. So we try to analyze um, um, about 15 to 16 different data is coming in from all, all over the world. Or, you know, there's so many tourism economics, there's, there's SDR, there's UNWTO, we have our own data as well. And you merge all of that and the picture starts uh, crystallizing. What, what is clear though, is that domestic tourism is expected to fill part of the demand supply gap mm -hmm. at some destinations and increase occupancy rates at hotels. However, countries that rely heavily on foreign tourism are finding and that relatively small domestic is not enough to fill the gap faced by the sector. You know, yep. so um, additionally, um, you know, there is an impact because of the Chinese outbound uh, tourism market uh, is expected to have a knock on effect on destinations worldwide because there was so much reliance on this market. Mm -hmm. And prior to the pandemic, Chinese travelers um, were contributing something like 9% of the outbound travel numbers globally, and 18% of international tourism receipts. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, there's another very uh, interesting um, statistic is the data from OAG, the flight capacities have decreased by at least 50% across the globe for, for the week beginning. I'm just telling you from June mm -hmm. 15th, onwards compared wow. to starting January 20th. Yeah. So, so there is a ripple I, effect all over. I just been on a plane uh, a week ago going from Singapore to Canada and I can tell you like it was way less than 50 percent uh, yeah. and the airports are quite a deserted place right now. So it's sad um, to really see that happening. Yeah. Um, the You mentioned governments uh, a little bit before and I think they will play a, a fundamental part moving forward in, in, in the recovery. But there is so many sectors that are affected by COVID-19. So what do, you th what do you see is the perceived value of tourism to governments these days? So kind of like, where, where are we on that value kind of like um, totem pole, so to say, in, in terms of um, recovery efforts? You know, um, the role of the governments, as we can see, have enhanced, as I said, they have become uh, big, uh, you know, and, and uh, very relevant under the, these circumstances. It's only an, uh, the governments who can pull this situation together. So for them, so we've, um, you know, I've been doing also my own town halls and we've been talking to so many stakeholders from all around the world, tourism boards, ministries. So our organization engages a lot with governments, you know, because we, we bring the governments and the private sector together on, on the same uh, platform. And, uh, and what we, we um, the sound bites that we are picking up, this, uh, that the, uh, their perceived values are around creating new social values or more sustainable tourism development. Um, uh, you know, there there is a push uh, for a faster race for vaccine and and uh, mm -hmm. to capture somehow um, the, the economy where it is at the uh, moment where it's pivoting. Um, you know, very negatively, mm -hmm. and there, there is a broader cooperation between health and tourism sector. This is for the uh, really really evident and now. I mean, in fact, only this morning I was having my. A meeting with one of the the international the uh, big banks and and they are like desperate that okay we we can talk about healthcare but can we use tourism as a vehicle to get the messaging across so which is very very uh, unique there's a focus on uh, mental and physical issues um, uh, you know the, 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 there's a focus on the, that the earth needs to be healthy and um, how can we do that through tourism and and boosting uh, political diplomacy this although there are some countries in our neighbor uh, hood you know who don't yeah. understand that what political diplomacy is <laughs> but there is something that is now making waves is the covid diplomacy yeah you know? And the, the, the countries are having to engage uh, the, the ones who didn't before, you know, and there, there are some very, very stark examples of that. It's all about partnerships and alliances at the moment. Yeah. And 
but having said that, uh, there are some key urgent issues if approached strategically and well built into the economic agendas could trigger a, a staged recovery. Uh, number one, manage the uh, crisis and mitigate the socioeconomic impacts on livelihoods, particularly women's employment issues okay, and security. Uh, boost competi uh, competitiveness and build resilience. Advance innovation and, and digital. Foster green growth. Partnerships and partnerships and partnerships to transform uh, the, the situation right now. I, I I think you bring up some so important points, and I one of the things I haven't even thought about before is kind of like uh, how many women are impacted by this because uh, the tourism nothing. industry does Huge. does employ so many women, uh, young people, also people across the spectrum of kind of like education and um, and and and. Uh, kind of uh, social status in a way, right? Kind of like tourism has a really wide um, spectrum of people that are engaged in it. So really, really hurts a lot of areas. Um, what do you think kind of, if we go back to traveling, kind of like uh, what are some of those stigmas that will remain? Do you think there will be any stigmas that will remain? I mean, I mean you mentioned some of the good sides that tourism can bring, but, uh, what, what are some of the stigmas that we will have to fight on the long run? I don't think so. There will be no, uh, there no. will be any stigmas. And uh, because COVID-19 has almost touched every country, we have no mm -hmm. distinguishment uh, amongst people who's carrying or not carrying the virus anymore. It can mm -hmm. be anybody, right? And mm -hmm. uh, the, the virus uh, is not sparing anybody here, whether they, they are president or prime ministers or, or the Joe Blau um, on the street. For the first time, the entire world has single com common enemy, enemy to battle and fight off. Mm -hmm. We have protocols on health and tourism and power of responsible communication, which is everybody um, uh, can share. And uh, you know, everybody can help identify safe destinations. And uh, so it's really the world has become flattened. They're talking about flattening the curve on the virus, but the virus has actually flattened the curve on the world itself. But will it not be that kind of like countries that have bigger economic uh, kind of like possibilities and kind of like, um, so to say the, the developed world in, in quotation marks, right? Uh, will they not have an easier time recovering quicker and leave some of the emerging countries behind? You know, uh, yes. Absolutely, and that this is. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I was in discussions with uh, with an organization who are at the forefront of of um, the uh, the the road to the vaccine. Okay, and uh, and their biggest concern is exactly this: that you will have a situation where the developing countries. Uh, will have the vaccine and the, sorry, developed countries will have the vaccine and the developing countries will be left behind. But there are a lot of institutions right now, uh, big um, organizations like World Bank, Asian Development Bank, some of these big organizations who are funding some of these researches are now coming behind. They formed um, uh, associations just to fight this aspect um, uh, of the pandemic and um, that nobody gets left behind. Already we are seeing in EU there's, an, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a real, real push now uh, that um, basically, you know, the, they're creating funds whereby, uh, you know, just to push the vaccines uh, that the, the richer countries will, will buy stocks for the poor countries. And a lot of uh, countries have contributed to it. Some, uh, some even mid-range countries have, have started contributing towards um, in these kind of funds. But, you know, uh, again, our neighbor, you know, the, the richest of rich, we are still waiting, you know, the, for them to put their hands in the pocket. So I think there, there is a big, big concern for that to happen. But there is at the same time, I'm very confident because I've, I've spoken to a few people that there's a real, real mitigation that is already taking place, you know, and, yeah. and that this could happen. But just going back onto that question of the, of the stigma, I think what will happen is perhaps travel will look and feel 
and how we book will be different. There will be longer queues, six feet apart. Um, uh, you've already experienced face masks. Uh, however, there will be travel season, uh, seasonality may change in the short term. Mm -hmm. Why? Because governments will need to turn lockdown measures on and off in order to keep demands on healthcare systems at a manageable level. Mm -hmm. This means there will be windows of opportunity to travel that last one week or, uh, or even days before the lockdown happens again. Mm -hmm. Even with airlines desperate to get airborne again, seats will be limited and we could see dramatic increases in pricing during those windows of opportunity mm -hmm. of travel. So this, this could become a norm, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, you hit a destination and then you find out that there's been a lockdown back home, what's happened between UK and Spain recently. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that's probably going to be more short term, right? The long term, yeah. hopefully, we will not face this ongoingly. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Um, and I, I just want to mention also kind of like because when we talked about emerging countries, developing countries, and you mentioned um, the effort to buy vaccines from some um, countries that uh, richer countries that starting doing that for countries that can't afford as much. Uh, I think also on the tourism side, we we need to see ourselves as having a responsibility because lots of emerging countries rely on tourism income even more than many of the developed countries when you look at some of the uh, distribution of income that uh, or their gdp um, and um, i think we need to keep that in mind for ourselves and try to help those destinations get back on their feet quickly uh, also in the meetings and incentives and business travel industry uh, understand that business travel causes business it kind of like enhances business so as sooner as we can start kind of dealing and working with kind of the whole world again the better it will be uh the faster recovery will happen in my opinion yeah um i just mentioned the meetings industry uh as well and um so you you worked in the meetings industry as well um so you know it well um we see that a lot of the conferences and so on have moved into the online world. Um, there's a lot more online offerings. I, I would say also in China, uh, which started meeting again, we see more regional national meetings. Do you think that that will impact international kind of like tourism on the long run that we will see meetings going slightly different route and decoupling themselves a bit more from tourism because it goes into these online offerings more and goes more into kind of like more dissemination of knowledge less about kind of like traveling yeah you you've just touched the the the, the point here you know what uh, one thing the current pandemic matches has shown us is that how important technology is for maintaining mm. and facilitating communication not simply for work purposes but for building real emotional connections in the next few years i believe we can expect to see this progress accelerate with AI technology built to connect people at a human level and drive them closer to each other, even when physically they're apart. Mm -hmm. The line between physical space and virtual space will uh, forever be blurred. And we are already yeah. living through that. We are, we are experiencing uh, that. The fact that you and I are doing this Zoom call today <laughs> is a fine example of that. Exactly. As with the majority of COVID-19 related adaptation, it remains to be seen whether changes in the my segment will remain once the health threat has subsided. There, there are a lot of... Uh, 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 guess works happening at the moment, so I, I, I want to avoid that because there is no clear data uh, to support that what the trend could look like. Looking further ahead, early signs of the appetite to return to traditional um, events uh, remain strong, uh, you know, with the opportunity for in-person networking and uh, an atmosphere that is difficult to replicate online. It may reassure industry players of the prospects for recovery as COVID-19 um, related restrictions are, are lifted because the ability to be able to look into each other's eyes and that hug, you can't do that online, Correct. right? And, and um, yes, we do business networking, but we build relationships and that, that human connection 
uh, it, I, I believe it is still uh, critical. However, regardless of the appeal of the traditional events, a virtual strategy enables exhibitors and speakers to use cost-effective means. And that has become very apparent during this pandemic. So yeah. we have to cover something, right? To reach a wider audience without the need of participants to travel. It's better for the planet. It's better for expenses. It's better for mm, time management, you know? This may provide a buffer, uh, you know, uh, to cancellations in the medium term. To some degree, a blended approach could enable planners uh, yeah. to use technology. So I, I feel that I don't think so. Meetings are going to go away, but um, they will be further enhanced by the online component. And um, I had my discussions happening with. Um, uh, uh, Marits um, just a few weeks ago, and and they all are hoping and keeping their fingers crossed that that is uh, the case. You know, I, I think people need to get out, and there is some aspect of the business relationships that still needs to happen with a handshake. Absolutely. You know, with the tr traditional values, you can't do a handshake through Absolutely. online. Media. Absolutely. And um, in absence of a scientific poll, I give you a very unscientific one. With this ICS Connect, we end every single conversation like this was fun, but let's do it in person very, very soon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we all feel like that. Yeah. Uh, so, Myra, do you see any upsides right now to, to what's been happening, what we've been going through in the last few months? Um, is there any positive, any learning we can take out of this? I, the biggest, um, I mean, uh, tourism has changed into a new page. Oh, yeah. It's turned and we, this is clear, right? Uh, but there are three values of tourism development in the, in the long term. Like more new smart tourism products will come out, you, uh, you know, more improvement of pro uh, professional skills. Um, skill development is important for tourism labor force and customers, technology, communications, problem solving and uh, skill analysis, customer service leadership will all have a very, very different uh, undertones to it. And there will be more responsibility for, uh, for producing and for consumption. And I think the biggest winner in all of this is still, I feel, uh, you know, that um, is sustainability and how uh, we, mm -hmm. we treat um, our mother earth. That's the biggest winner here. Mm -hmm. Very good point, uh, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I think it also fostered a lot of creativity and resilience um, in the last few months. And I wonder, like in your experience, in your conversations, are there any good examples you have you could tell us about um, creativity and resilience you have experienced? Yeah, I do actually, and it's uh, with uh, my own organization, World Tourism Forum Institute. So uh, okay. it's a really interesting case study because I joined them uh, officially. I was already engaged uh, with them. There was an engagement period for nearly a year and a half, but officially, I uh, I joined them in January 2020, and in Perfect February. Timing. 2020, so, <laughs> so, uh, so it was really it's a uh, so I. I joined the organization because they have a global investment forum. That's the flagship of the organization. So everything in the organization was built around this one conference. And uh, obviously when COVID happened, all of our conferences and meetings started canceling. And, uh, and there was a pa panic in the camp. Uh, you know, wh uh -huh. what are we going to do? I mean, uh, you, you see them, you went through that as well. One by one, you know, the paths start uh, falling off. So for me, um, I had not yet met the team because the team is spread all over the world. Uh, we are a virtual organization we are with the headquarters in UK, the few team members there, but the rest of them are all spread over. And uh, it just gave me an opportunity. And I said, okay, let's take a deep breath and step back. And um, uh, what we did was that we found opportunity to reinvent ourselves from conference-based model to a travel and tourism think tank model. In March, when we saw all of our conferences were canceling, so, uh, you know, we, uh, okay, what do you do uh, uh, next? You know, not so much about, it wasn't so much about survival, but about relevance. How do we stay relevant in this climate, you know, when all meetings are just dying around us? And so there had to be a clear shift from celebrating tourism to its effectiveness, to educating about its relevance in a 
post pandemic era to re that tourism can actually help to reshape economies and it will help to rebound the jobs and it will help to alleviate poverty um, as and when uh, this pandemic stops raging upon people's livelihood. So that was the theme that we took forward and we said, okay, that how do we do that? You know, so, uh, so we turned from a conference-based org organization to a more sustainable knowledge-based org organization. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, we realized the power of online and launched two or three very distinct platforms our town halls, bringing the governments and private sector together, our investor halls, keeping the investor community buoyant. As we realize the governments will need this community to, to help restart economies as soon as the pandemic is over. I yeah. think looking back, we will be a very yeah. good case study of that creativity Perfect. and resilience. That's perfect, and it's great. And I think that's a perfect segue also into actually my final question for you, which is what is your personal outlook and your personal hope uh, moving forward and looking forward? Mattis, you know me, I'm ever positive. <laughs> that's why I'm talking to you. I always like talking to positive people. We, you know, I think we all ex uh, folks, we have that in us. Exactly. Know? And uh, I truly, believe travel and tourism is is the glue to hold this world together today yeah. and it is that vaccine the world needs uh, to heal you know i know we are all running after this vaccine in a, a particular vaccine you know but really to be honest to to help deal with our mental health um, you know, it is really important for us to heal and travel and tourism, you know, will help us do that. Will, that healing process will happen once uh, it, it opens up and jump starts in earnest. And because I believe travel is, is intrinsic to the very basic survival of human race. I really believe and hope whatever the hurdles this uh, pandemic presents, we will overcome this. this and I believe this industry is here to stay. But what's the next normal is being defined as we speak. And we, we need to just embrace it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's travel and meeting people around the globe and these international connections. Um, every good thing that we look at in our world, every good development that has come out has somewhere started with a connection with people, with people meeting each other. And the more we kind of do that around the globe and meet people from everywhere, um, the better it is. I mean, like, I'm somebody who was born in this mountain town in Austria, you were born in Pakistan. And here we sit together and we chat. And this is only the power of international connections that really absolutely. bring absolutely. And, and bring how long together. we have known each other. And now I'm exactly. talking to you after so many, I think two, three years, and it seems like exactly. yesterday, you know? I know. And that's the power of international connection. And I think tourism and travel is, is the way to kind of form those connections. And uh, I, I love that as a sentiment and as a final message for everybody out there to think positive and look forward to the next time we can travel and meet each other again at one of these beautiful places around the globe. Thank you, Mattis. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. The opportunity and take care and be safe, my friend. Good. Okay. You too. Thank you so much, Samara. And thank you everyone for listening.